All right, so we are now going to be recording it, so other people will be able to get a hold of this. Um, assuming that's okay with you, Scott. Sure, that's fine. Okay. Um, and the, the same system will go. Scott will do his talk, and while he's talking, you can actually be putting things in the chat, and that makes it a lot easier for me to then moderate questions and answers, and I can uh, nominate who gets to go next and things like that. Um, but obviously, you can also shout out if you need to. So that's the way things will work in the Q&A. But in the meantime, Scott is going to do his presentation. I do just want to give him a bit of formal uh, introduction. And Scott is a Charlestonian born and reared. Uh, I can give you his whole academic career from high school onwards, Middleton High School, then off to Georgetown for undergrad, William and Mary for a master's degree in uh, American studies. And then as you can see on the wall behind him, off to Louisiana State for his PhD. And Scott has been teaching at the College of Charleston since 1996, with a prior year before that, even as a visiting assistant professor. So he has uh, a march of at least one year on me. Um, but he and I shared an office for about the first five or six years. So we are really quite uh, good friends and colleagues for these many years. Uh, Scott has become probably the number one or number two uh, post scholar in the entire country, which means he's the number one or number two scholar, post scholar in the entire world. Um, and he's got a number of books out on Edgar Allan Poe, including this brand new one, which I'm just gonna share the, the cover with you, The Man of the Crowd, Edgar Allan Poe and the City, with photographs by Michel Van Paris, who's a professor of photography here at the College of Charleston. And Scott has a presentation about this, a kind of book launch with Buxton, I think it is, Scott? Yeah. Uh, on Tuesday at seven. So if anybody's interested, um, maybe Scott, you can put the, the, the Zoom link or the information about that um, in the chat for folks. Yeah. And if they want to um, learn about Edgar Allan Poe in the city in that book, uh, you're very, very welcome to do that. But anyway, uh, we are really, really lucky to have Scott. He's one of the superstar members of the English department and the College of Charleston faculty at large. And yeah, he's shaking his head, but he is. He, he is. Um, and uh, I say, we're really lucky to have him. He's very he's passionate about music, by the way, and everything I know about American music basically comes from Scott Peoples. So uh, the fact that he's gonna be talking to you about Bob Dylan, you're in for a treat. Okay, over to you, Scott. Right. <laughs> Thanks, Simon. I, can we just go now? That was so nice that, I, you know, <laughs> Are you going to tell us about Bob Dylan? <laughs> um, no, really, thanks, thanks a lot. Um, and I apologize in advance for any uh, background noise that might uh, interrupt me. Uh, I'm just kind of keeping my fingers crossed here on the back porch. Um, but um, yeah, thanks so much for having me. Uh, and this, uh, just thinking about doing this presentation has got me excited about the prospect of teaching um, my course on Dylan, uh, again, hopefully pretty soon. Uh, and that's actually what I'm gonna talk about. Um, I thought maybe the best way to, uh, to do a session on Dylan would be to tell you a little bit about the, the course that I teach, which is called Bob Dylan and the American Dream. Uh, and then we'll just see where that takes us and, and, hope, and I'm sure it'll take us into an into a interesting discussion. Um, but uh, I started teaching this course, uh, I'm thinking, something like 15 years ago uh, when we had the governor's school summer program for uh, rising high school seniors. Uh, and I was asked to come up with a course that, um, you know, that, that um, would be somewhat interdisciplinary and uh, that might engage students. And so I started with a course called uh, Dylan and Whitman, uh, which was half Bob Dylan, half Walt Whitman. And uh, it went pretty well, but um, I, I learned from doing that, that maybe there was a little too much Whitman for the occasion. And, and uh, so uh, the next time I did it, I, I turned it into Bob Dylan and the American Dream, where instead of focusing just on Walt Whitman, I did Whitman and a handful of other uh, sort of earlier American writers who I thought uh, had some resonances in Dylan's work and in Dylan's career. And I kind of developed that since I've taught it as a first year experience class. And most recently I taught it as an upper level uh, English class. So um, let me share the screen and I'll show you what the syllabus looks like. And there it is. 
So I last taught it uh, two, two years ago. Um, and the, the, the other texts that we read sort of before we get to Dylan, we don't read the entire autobiography of Benjamin Franklin, but we read parts of it. We read a, a, a sort of strange postmodern novel by Melville called The Confidence Man, um, some Ginsburg, and then some, some, other, uh, some other things like Nathaniel Hawthorne's story, My Kinsman Major Molyneux, uh, Song of Myself and Crossing Brooklyn Ferry by Whitman, um, Richard Wright's story, The Man Who Lived Underground. So we sort of do a really, you know, condensed crash course in sort of classic American literature, um, very, you know, highly selective, cherry picked, of course, to set up some of the things that we're going to find in, in Dylan. Uh, and then the last two thirds of the course pretty much just trace Dylan's career. Um, thanks to Spotify, this is a lot easier to do in terms of the music. I used to have to make bootleg CDs and leave them on reserve at the library in the old days. Now I can just make a Spotify playlist uh, and students can, uh, can go to that. Uh, and then, you know, along the way we read um, mostly journalism about Dylan from different points in his career, uh, like the, the classic uh, Nat Hentoff New Yorker piece from around 1964. Um, and there, you know, there are good anthologies of writing about Dylan uh, that we use in the class. And we read Dylan's uh, memoir, Chronicles Volume 1, along the way in, in sort of in chunks um, and just kind of follow through his career. As you would expect, spending more time on the 60s uh, than, the, than the later parts of his career, but trying to you know, pretty much cover the whole thing. So in terms of, uh, in terms of themes, I mean, what I'm, the logic behind uh, the connection between Dylan and uh, classic American literature, which is really what I, what I teach most of the time, um, is, is a focus on kind of the American myth of uh, self-fashioning or being able to recreate yourself, uh, leave or completely leave the past behind, uh, which I think Dylan is basically all about uh, as someone who uh, in terms of his persona and 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 his uh, songwriting, makes these really radical breaks with what he had been doing, constantly defying expectations, uh, and of course pissing people off in the process by not being the not being the guy that he was or the performer that he was a few years ago. Um, of course, you know, going electric is the sort of the epitome of that, but also. Uh, going Christian in the late 70s, uh, it, you know, sort of the other big rupture. So Dylan's relationship with his audience, but also just this idea that uh, Dylan is enacting this very American uh, move repeatedly of um, sort of, you know, just burning up the past and, and reinventing himself. Um, and also just the sort of fierce independence, uh, the pros and cons of being a, like a Rolling Stone, um, which uh, a lot of those earlier texts, Benjamin Franklin, the Hawthorne story uh, really deal with. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's sort of the, the, the basic kind of theme of the course. Um, I'll just give you a, I'm gonna run very quickly through a couple of the slide presentations that I use in the course to, to give you an idea of how I, you know, how I try to teach this. So this is really just sort of when we get to the point where we're summing up uh, the first portion of the course and talking about American individualism as seen through various writers that we would have read in the first four or five weeks, uh, going from Franklin to the Hawthorne story, My Kinsman Major Molyneux, uh, we throw in some de Tocqueville uh, from Democracy in America, then get to Whitman, Thoreau, and then jump forward about 100 years to Ginsburg. Uh, and so those are just some of the things that we read early on to set up the, the Dylan portion of the show. Uh, and then when we get to Dylan, I'll just show you a couple of, you know, very quickly again run through some of the things that we talk about.
when we when we get to blood on the tracks, which um, you know, sort of, if not everybody's favorite Dylan album, you know, one of everybody's top two or three probably, uh, and a lot of the students, by the way, of you know, they're they're familiar with this ma mainly through their parents or increasingly grandparents' um, fascination with Dylan. So they usually come in with with some familiarity, but you know, but but not a sense of Dylan's entire career. But when we get to Blood on the Tracks, uh, I, I try to focus on painting. Uh, Dylan started, uh, he sort of took up painting around the time that he was working on Blood of the Tracks. Uh, and then later has had several, uh, several exhibits uh, and it's just sort of, and he also does sculpture, uh, iron work. Um, but it, it played a big role apparently in the development of uh, the songs on Blood on the Tracks. So this, um, in this interview, he talks about meeting uh, the, the artist Norman Rabin, who was a big influence on him around that, that time in the early to mid-70s. And also the, um, that experience seems to have unfortunately led to the breakup of Dylan's marriage, which provides a lot of the content for the songs on Blood on the Tracks. And so we, um, you know, we do get into some of the autobiographical aspects of the songs on the album, as well as the techniques that Dylan was developing as a songwriter that were sort of analogous to painting. One of the, and, and of course we will spend some time just going through, uh, going through some of the songs. This obviously is Tangled Up in Blue. Um, and I'll also mention that one of the assignments the students have is to do an annotation presentation. So a student might have chosen Tangled Up in Blue and they would come to class with um, an annotated, usually PowerPoint, but some kind of presentation uh, on, on the song where they have at least 10 footnotes that help to elucidate different lines. Um, and with Tangled Up in Blue, I mean, one of the things that, that I do with it is to talk about the different versions of it because Dylan famously rewrites songs after he's originally recorded them. Um, and he does this a lot with this particular song because he's performed it pretty consistently uh, throughout his career. And one of the things that you notice and that, you know, we, that one of the things that we discuss is that he shifts from first person to third person in, and also changes a lot of the details in, in this verse. And the shifts from first to third person really kind of create this almost collage uh, uh, effect entangled up in blue. It also jumps around temporally. So it's not one story, it's a story of apparently different people at different times in history that all sort of, uh, that all sort of meld together. So here's another contrast in different versions of the song, uh, depending on what year he's performing it. And I think that kind of gets us back to the painting uh, metaphor. Dylan even said in, in a 1978 interview, um, I was just trying to make it like a painting where you can see different parts, but then you see the whole of it with that particular song. And he's talking about Tangled Up in Blue. That's what I was trying to do with the concept of time, the way characters change from first person to third person. You're never quite sure if the first person is talking or the third person is talking. But as you look at the whole thing, it doesn't really matter. Oh, and that was an assignment and that's something else. So, um, so that's one of the things that we, that we do. Um, I'll run through another sort of quick slide deck. When we get to more recent, relatively more recent Dylan albums and we talk about the album Love and Theft, uh, I focus more on issues of plagiarism, uh, which have, uh, you know, gotten a lot of attention in Dylan's work in the 21st century. Um, and whether it's sort of legitimate appropriation of other sources, um, or is Dylan just kind of stealing stuff. And that discussion really kind of uh, gained a lot of steam with the Love and Theft album, which came out in 2001. Dylan lifted a lot of lines from uh, a book called Confessions of a, of a Yakuza, which is a memoir uh, by Jun, uh, Junichi Saga. And I've just underlined, you know, this is what I do for students. I underline some of the 
lines that are lifted from Confessions of a Yakuza. This is from the, the song Floater. And then um, the, the next album that Dylan did after that, Modern Times, uh, kind of con continued to lift uh, a lot of lyrics as well as melodies from other songs and generated more controversy. In particular, kind of a cool local angle, you, you may know about this, that uh, Dylan uh, appropriated a lot of lines from Henry, Henry Timrod, the, the poet laureate of the Confederacy uh, in his album, Modern Times. And so, you know, I, I try to generate some discussion with students about uh, what they think of this. Um, is this different from what he was doing early in his career by rewriting, for instance, Scarborough Affair as Girl from the North Country or using the melody of a Woody Guthrie song to write a tribute to Woody Guthrie? Um, do the same rules apply when we're talking about songwriting as when we're talking about academic work um, and why or why not? We, you know, we talk about remix culture and collage and the way that Dylan either does or doesn't figure into that. And along those same lines, um, Dylan took the title of that album, Love and Theft, from an academic book um, by Eric Lott, which is about blackface minstrelsy. Um, and Lott, you know, later wrote about Dylan using <laughs> using his uh, book title, because there's also a, sort of a, a kind of minstrelsy kind of feel to a lot of the songs on Love and Theft. So it does definitely seem to have been on Dylan's mind. And whether he read the book or not, he seems to have been at least vaguely familiar with it. And so we read an essay by Lot to talk about some of the issues he, he raises. Sorry, I know I'm going really quickly through this, but I'm just trying to give you a sense of the sorts of things that we do in the course. Um, and the way that uh, Dylan really works, I think, extremely well for um, for uh, different sorts of discussions. Um, we do analyze song lyrics. I think a lot of students come in thinking, okay, this is going to be a course where we treat Bob Dylan as a poet and we're going to just read his song lyrics all semester. And we do a little bit of that, but we don't, you know, that's not really the main focus. It's, you know, try to uh, make the course an overview of Dylan's career and um, why it's significant culturally. Um, it, it is in part a study of, uh, of his songs, both as lyrics and as performances. Uh, and then there's this other element of tying Dylan in with uh, the idea of the American dream as it's represented in uh, you know, what I would call classic American literature. Um, let's see. The other, uh, the other thing I wanted to mention, there are a few films that are really crucial for the, for the uh, course as well. We always watch uh, Martin Scorsese's No Direction Home uh, documentary. I haven't taught it since Scorsese put out the Rolling Thunder documentary, which I think is great, and that'll be good material for the next time I, I get to teach it. But then also Todd Haynes' uh, feature film, I'm Not There which if you haven't seen, it's just wonderful if you're a Dylan fan, really fascinating uh, movie. And I kind of half kiddingly tell students that the whole point of this course is, it, is for you to be able to watch I'm Not There and understand it um, because it, it very much fits in. My, my approach in the course to, to Dylan's career is very consistent with what, with what uh, Todd Haynes does in that, in that film. So that's... Um, that's my course. Uh, and I think, uh, Simon, did that time out okay in terms of balancing presentation with uh, Q&A? That's great, Scott. That's, that's wonderful. Um, and we already have a question in the, in the chat from uh, John Yamaragovic. You have to unmute yourself, John. There we go. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I, I am interested in uh, a little deeper exploration of that notion of why an artist would feel that unattributed plagiarism is appropriate. You know, I mean, I can see it happening to anybody in terms of like, you have a catchphrase or two that has just really resonated with you and it appears, as opposed to where you've clearly, there are 13 or 14 direct copy lines 
that are on point and they're in a poem or, or something you've written or music. So it's clear that you're doing that intentionally. And then the second to that is do those artists who do that then feel that it's appropriate for other people to equally anonymously sample their work? Yeah. Uh, do you want me to take a stab at that or just sort of open it up to everybody? It, oh, I'm, I'm fine either way. Um, I mean, I think, it, you know, you, you put that really well. It's, a, it's exactly the kinds of questions that, that, I'm, that I'm interested in. Um, I think that, I think a lot of people let Dylan off the hook too easily uh, on this issue uh, because they don't, you know, they want to continue to admire him on every level. Uh, and I do think that, you know, there is a difference between appropriating a folk melody, which uh, is, is just something that's kind of a time-honored tradition, and doing what Dylan does, particularly in his memoir, which, I mean, people have gone through chronicles and found you know, lots of phrases, you know, that are lifted from other texts. I think there's, there is a kind of fundamental difference there. And I don't, and I also think that when you lift, I mean, other people do this all the time. They lift lines from earlier songs or they sample other music and then they give credit for it in the liner notes or somewhere on, you know, on the, the official release. Yeah. Dylan has a bad habit of not doing that. Um, yeah. And so while I think the act of appropriation itself is uh, artistically justified, uh, I'm not necessarily cool with not acknowledging what it is you're appropriating. Yeah, I, 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 thank you for that. I, I, I can intellectually, I, I mean, I even see it as a form of tribute um, as long as it's acknowledged. Um, and I guess what really, you know, fundamentally confuses me when you're, especially when you're looking at somebody of, of his uh, standing, you know, what do you gain by not attributing it? So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And, and he and he doesn't like it when other people do it to him. Ah, okay. He's the litigious. second part of the question, yeah. He's pretty litigious when other people, that was the, you might've noticed that brief mention of Hootie and the Blowfish. Their song, um, I Only Want to Be With You, uh, lifts lines uh, from uh, Idiot Wind. Mm -hmm. uh, and they attribute it in the song. They mentioned Dylan. I mean, and he still, um, you know, he still took him to court over it. Wow. Thank you, Scott. Yeah. What sort of uh, damages did he go for? Was he excessive or was he just trying to keep him in, in check sort of thing? I think it was more trying to keep him in check. There might've been some court, some kind of out of court settlement. Um, but, but I know it did, you know, uh, it, he did pursue it, you know, and I, which I thought was really kind of cheap since it was clearly a tribute to him and not, not an attempt to rip him off. Do you have your students watch uh, The Last Waltz as well, Scott? Um, I don't, be, you know, just because I can only squeeze in so much film, we don't do The Last Waltz, but, you know, I talk about it when we get to Rolling Thunder Review and that era. I guess it doesn't really add very much about him. It's just, it's just pure pleasure, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Any other uh, questions or, or, or comments? Anybody ever had any uh, queries about Bob Dylan lyrics that you go, where is that coming from? I'm sure there must be a few. You mean when people offer interpretations? Well, or yeah, or, or, or I was wondering whether anybody on the on the call here has always wondered what the heck a, a particular uh, oh, oh. Dylan lyric meant, and maybe you can answer it. Oh, but, probably not, but go ahead. Is there Scott? Any Hey, good morning. Um, Hi, Lisa. How are you? So, good. so glad how you could join us. I'm doing all right. Um, the examples you put up where there's a sentence lifted and underlined, I'm going, hmm. And then there was one example where there were multiple sentences in a row mm -hmm. lifted that you've underlined. Um, clearly, like there's no discussion, there's no gray area there. But when you put up love and theft it's two words with and in between and if i were to write a song or a book or anything 
do I need to make sure that those two words have never been put together and published in any way? I mean, like that, I, you know, maybe he read that, maybe he saw it on a bookshelf somewhere. Maybe he didn't. Maybe he just wanted to write about love, which a lot of songwriters do, and theft, which a lot of songwriters don't. But do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, it could, yes, it, it certainly could be a coincidence, but um, it's also partly the nature of uh, Eric Lott's book. Um, I mean, not just that it's called Love and Theft, but that it's, it's about 19th century minstrel music um, and appropriation itself. It's, you know, it's about the, the act of appropriation. And then right. when Dylan released that album not long after, he it's he put love and theft in quotation marks as the title of the album just to kind of add to that uh, sense of it being lifted from somewhere. Hmm. And on it's kind of hard to describe, but I mean if you you know, I'm sure you've listened to the to the album, but um, it has a sort of um, some of the songs have that kind of minstrelsy vaudeville feel to them um and i don't know i mean i'll, I'll just say that a lot of people picked up on it at the time lots okay. book was for an academic book it was sort of a, a, a blockbuster uh and would have been the you know it had a little bit of crossover and um i think when dylan when dylan was asked about whether that was whether he had that book title in mind he was very cagey about it, like he would neither confirm nor deny. Um, so, I mean, it just, I'll just say that, in, you know, among sort of Dylan heads who also study 19th century American culture, it seemed like a connection that was there. Okay, all right. So Scott, what, the last time you, you taught the course, had Dylan uh, won his Nobel Prize by that time? Yes. Ah, okay. Um, and so that's also, you know, that's a, another fun thing to talk about. Um, both the controversy surrounding to it, which was basically not to acknowledge it for a long time. Uh, and then, then he, I think he found out that in order to collect the money, he had to do a speech. And so he did. Uh, and then much of the speeches, if not if not plagiarized, at least borrowed from Sparknotes. Uh, so there's this kind of, you know, this perversity in Dylan's, uh, the, the way that Dylan does these things. It, the, the deeper you go with it, the, in some ways, the less admirable he is, but also the more, all the more fascinating because he just, you know, uh, I mean, you know, specifically he, uh, Go ahead, Simon. Sorry. Uh, do, you, do you think that's de deliberately sort of poking them and saying, you know, this is kind of silly that you gave me this massive award and, and therefore I'm going to send it up by doing something that is really kind of outrageous? Or is it just sloppiness? Really? No. Or no, I'd look at it a little bit differently. I think he really, I think, I think he definitely felt that he deserved it. And I think the award meant something to him uh, based on, you know, based on what I've, I've read. Um, but I also think that uh, he kind of likes to see what he can get away with, and he also likes to um, not meet people's expectations, but to do something different. Um, I know that's that's kind that sounds kind of <laughs> maybe that sounds kind of obvious, but um, uh, I think he must have known that he had been on the short list for the Nobel in literature for years, which he, which he was. There had been talk about Dylan winning it for a long time before he finally did. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I think it was a genuine response, though he was determined. You were, you were cutting in and out there. Um, John's got a, a question about favorites. John, you want to go? Yeah, I was just going to say um, your personal favorite, uh, Hendrix or Dylan version of Along the Watchtower? Oh, uh, Hendrix, I yeah. think by a, by a long shot. Yeah. Um, 
uh, I think it's one of a small number of covers of Dylan songs that's better than the original. And Dylan, when he performs, the last couple of times I've heard him perform all on the Watchtower, he does the Hendrix arrangement. Um, so I think even I think even Dylan knows that Hendrix version is <laughs> yeah, not done there. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Mari. You sound a bit incredulous about that. I just I recognize the talent of Jimi Hendrix, but I do not like anything he's ever done. <laughs> <laughs> It's just, it's too screechy guitar. It's too <laughs> over the top. It's, I feel Dylan in my soul. The way I feel like George Harrison in my soul. And then Jimi Hendrix is just out there making noise. <laughs> Very talented noise, but it's noise. <laughs> It's funny, that's really close to what I've heard a lot of people say about Dylan. It's like, oh yeah, I get that he's a that's genius, fair. but I just cannot stand him, you know, that voice, oh my God. That's what my wife always says about Dylan, Scott. Um, hates it when I listen to anything. I have to have to make sure she's out of the house before I turn anything on by uh, yeah. Bob Dylan. Was it, I, mean, he, I uh, also like the voice of June Carter Cash though, so <laughs> I have poor taste. So Scott, uh, Dylan was the first songwriter to win the Nobel Prize for Literature, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So the, what, I, I mean, I can't really remember their citation. What, how did they, I mean, it's a very, it was, it was a really unusual choice. How, so what did they pick out in Dylan that made him uh, worthy of a literature prize rather than, a, you know, something else? I mean, I think it was, I mean, I don't remember very specifically what the citation said, but um, but I think the gist of it was to recognize, first of all, to recognize songwriting as a, as a literary form. And uh, I think they focused mainly on how Dylan had transformed it uh, and, and used a lot of techniques that people are more likely to associate with poetry in, in song lyrics than had been attempted before. Um, but I mean, since you, since you brought that up, I mean, that's another thing that we talk about in, in my course. Um, is the relationship between song lyrics and poetry. And, you know, I think I kind of try to steer students in the direction of saying that it, it's sort of a mistake to read song lyrics as poetry, even when they're poetic like Dylan's, because there's just a different set, it's a different genre. And so a lot of the hue and cry over Dylan winning the Nobel was from people saying, well, if you, if you put his lyrics up against, you know, a, a really great poet, they just don't, you know, they don't hold up. He's not as he's not as good as a great poet. But that's only if you're reading them as poetry. I mean, I think you have to take him as a songwriter, and I think that. That's, um, I'm you know I'm, I am getting this award for what I do as a songwriter. Mm -hmm. Uh, and to some extent as a performer, uh, he, you know, of course, Dylan, not, not one to stand on false modesty, he compared himself to Shakespeare, uh, in that Shakespeare had to worry about production. Mm -hmm. uh, when he was writing his plays, he wasn't thinking, I'm going to sit down and write a literary masterpiece. Mm -hmm. He was thinking, how is this going to go over at the, at the Globe Theater next week? How can I stage mm -hmm. this? You know, what are, you know, and Dylan says, that's, you know, that's what a musician has to do too. I'm not right, you know, I'm not writing uh, collections of poetry. I'm writing songs that I can perform on stage and I have all of the same kinds of, uh, you know, performance things to think about that uh, a playwright does. Nobody else is gonna ask questions. Uh, do you wanna talk a little bit about your, your recent piece that you had in what, a salon or slate? Uh, yeah, it was, it, it, uh, it came out in Salon. It was um, when Dylan released, uh, before he released Rough and Rowdy Ways, his latest uh, album, he put out uh, first Murder Most Foul, the long, like, you know, 20 minute meditation kind of circling around the assassination of Kennedy. 
And then uh, a, a shorter but somewhat similar song called uh, I Contain Multitudes. And when that one came out, I immediately went, okay, I got to write something about this because you know my course originated with Dylan, with Dylan and Whitman and I Contain Multitudes being the famous, famous phrase from the end of Song of Myself. Uh, and so the, the, the piece that I wrote is sort of about Dylan uh, in that song and in Murder Most Foul, really uh, positioning himself as a 21st century Walt Whitman and, and not just, not appropriating Whitman in the way that he appropriated Confessions of a Yakuza, but sort of formally trying to, you know, trying to write in that way. Um, and so I, you know, I, I worked in some other allusions that Dylan makes to American writers of uh, Whitman's generation, uh, references to Poe and Melville as well, uh, that we talk about some in the course, but that basically I Contain Multitudes was Dylan kind of saying, I wanna be like Walt Whitman or I am like Walt Whitman. So I felt sort of vindicated uh, when, when that song came out. So actually Mara has a question, which is sort of going the other way. Who's, who's been um, influenced by Dylan? So Mara, you wanna put that question? Um, yeah. Are there any modern artists you would say are really following in his footsteps to write poetic lyrics? Um, I mean, to some extent, I think he, I mean, he opened up the possibilities of songwriting so much that it's one of those influence questions where, you know, it, it I, I got to think that almost everybody has been influenced by Dylan, even if they don't recognize it, because he just changed the rules, and they've never, and it's never been the same since. Um, it's more like I think when you try to think of uh, contemporary songwriters, it's more you know thinking who seems particularly Dylan-esque. Um, I mean, one guy that that comes to mind um, is Connor Oberst. Uh, who has uh, you know performed as Bright Eyes for many years and has done uh, you know has also done work under his own name. Mm -hmm. um, his his affect is pretty is is pretty Dylan esque and his songwriting I think is is in, is overtly uh, indebted to to Dylan. Um, trying to think of, of, of who else comes to mind. I mean, I guess I tend to think of older artists and not people who are, you know, under 50. Um, but, you know, the, you know, the whole slew of New Dylans in the, in the 70s, and we, I, I do some of that in the course too, you know, Patti Smith being probably the, the, the greatest example. Um, uh, but also, yeah, you know, um, everybody. I mean, Springsteen, I mean, he's almost as old as Dylan, but, you know, the, the, it's hard to imagine uh, Springsteen doing what he did without Dylan blazing the trail. Um, yeah, I'm, I mean, if I, I could, I'm sorry that I can't think of, off the top of my head, I can't think of more, you know, relatively younger artists who seem to really be following, uh, sort of following in Dylan's footsteps as songwriters, but I'm, I'm sure there are there, there are a lot who, you know, who would acknowledge that. I think you answered that well. Thank you. I was thinking maybe Lucinda Williams with a, a, a poet father might be a, a case in point, Scott. Yeah, yeah, sure. What, what about uh, um, spirituality? I mean, you mentioned the, the, the shift to Christianity and, um, you know, when I always think of Dylan, I always think of, of Leonard Cohen, whom I actually actually think in some ways as a poet is uh, a better poet than uh, Dylan and his his songs have a very strong uh, spiritual uh, basis to them as well. Uh, how, how deep is Dylan's spirituality do you think? I think it was very deep when he I mean I, you know when he went fundamentalist uh, Christian for several years I mean, I, I think he really meant it. I don't think that was some kind of uh, stunt. Um, I think that's mellowed uh, in more recent years. And I don't know, I mean, he's pretty, mm, uh, he's pretty cagey about his, his uh, religious beliefs these days. But I don't think that uh, Christian period 
faded all that quickly. I mean, and, and I think that he's still, um, in some ways, is still sort of there. And though obviously you know, he, he, he gave up writing gospel songs a long time ago, but. Um, no trace of the Jewish uh, background? Well, yeah, I mean, I think that that, that shows up uh, from time to time, like on the, um, the album Infidels, uh, especially. Um, and in fact, there's a, you know, I think it's on Infidels. Yes, there's a song called Neighborhood Bully, which is a really yeah. kind of very pro-Israel song. Yeah. Uh, it's almost more political than it is religious, but I mean, it, but yeah, I think he definitely feels his Jewish background as well. The other, I mean, the other thing that I find kind of fascinating, particularly in in Dylan's 21st century uh, work is this sort of apocalyptic tone that you can trace back to like hard rain. Um, but there's really this, you know, <laughs> uh, this strong sense of foreboding and judgment in a lot of his uh, more recent uh, songs as well. Interesting. Well, we're about out of time. Is there anybody else with a final question? Maybe Himalayan's just coming into the room at the moment. <laughs> uh, Donna said. I don't have a question, but I want to make a, a quick comment, if I may. Um, I'm a retired English teacher. Uh, my training is in medieval uh, literature. And I find interesting, of course, I know that, uh, Scott, you're talking in the context of Dylan with lyrics versus poetry. Uh, but I, when I taught poetry, I gave students the opportunity to bring in a song and to analyze the song as poetry um, and not just as lyrics. So uh, mm -hmm. I find it interesting what you uh, have done with Dylan looking at him as a, a lyricist separate from a poet. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it's an interesting set of questions too, because it's not as if, I mean, they're clearly closely related or people wouldn't talk about, you know, wouldn't talk about them in the same breath so much. And uh, I think one of the, one of the ways that Dylan changed the rules for songwriting was by just greatly increasing the possibilities by doing the kinds of things that poets do with literary illusions uh, and um, you know, and, and a kind of almost a time stream of consciousness uh, style of, of, of songwriting that you hadn't seen in Tin Pan Alley, certainly, or early rock and roll. Um, but at the same, I mean, so I, I think, you know, what I try to get at is that these are not, it's not like, well, if songwriting gets good enough, we can call it poetry. And I don't really, I don't want my students to think of it that way. I really want them to think of it as these are two different endeavors that have a lot in common, but you have to take them on their own terms. Great. That's a very clear, uh, succinct definition, I think, Scott. Thank you. And thank you very much for the, the talk generally. Um, next week, we have Margaret Seidler coming to talk about slave traders in the family. Margaret, again, is another long, long uh, lived Charles Stoning going back sort of seven or eight generations here. And she was doing some genealogical research and she discovered uh, to her horror that actually she had slave traders in her uh, ancestry. So she's going to be uh, talking about that next week. But in the meantime, we do have to get off the line to open this up for the worship uh, service to take it take place in the same room so thank you very much indeed scott everybody wave hands so yay that was absolutely terrific thank you very much indeed well thanks everybody i enjoyed this thanks does everyone know how much we uh adored dylan in the day of your students <laughs> um they get a sense of that and, and a lot of that is because usually um some uh seniors will take the course they'll audit it and they make oh. that very they make that very clear to the 20 year olds yeah i got gotcha. you okay <laughs> thank you when are you teaching it again scott so we can get some uh, yeah i don't know hopefully in the next year um well let, let me know so i can let this crowd know because i think we'll probably will get uh, quite a few people who would be interested in <laughs> yeah right. yeah thank you. Right. sorry we do have to go though okay thanks a lot folks thanks, thanks scott you. bye